I had to look it up, but apparently the opposite of phallic is yonic, from the Sanskrit word yoni, meaning the womb or the source. There's no shortage of pointing out the phallic symbolism on film, of which Onibaba does have its share, but there doesn't seem to be as much delving into the yonic. Sadako climbing out of the well. The women of the descent navigating their way through narrow cave passages. Dolores Claiborne leaping over the well, which itself seems to be an homage or derivative of Onibaba's own yonic suggestion. What else would you call it? Two women killing and disappearing men down a deep, dark pit? If the yonic is the source, the yonic might also be the terminus. Onibaba, which translates to the English as Demon Woman, opens on a sea of tall grass blowing in the wind, the first of many writhing hypnotic refrains. These dense, seemingly endless marshes are the sum total of the landscape, almost the entirety of the world depicted on screen. It's a blank canvas on which to paint the drama, a purgatory where whatever wanders in never makes it out again. Such is the case when two soldiers, one of them wounded, flee into the marsh detached from some faraway battle. They evade their pursuers in the tall grass. They fall on their backs exhausted, barely clinging to life. Suddenly a pair of spears, wielded by unseen attackers, thrust from the overgrowth, piercing and killing the two men. Cautiously, the attackers venture out into the open. The film gives them no names. They're known only as the older woman and the younger woman. The women appear like wild animals, the older woman with a shock of white hair like the warning markings for some poisonous insect or reptile. The women are disheveled, but their kimonos appear new and clean, most likely the spoils from a previous catch, perhaps a lingering vain indulgence. The women strip the soldiers of their weapons and armor, then throw their bodies unceremoniously down into the pit. They trade the weapons and armor to an old man in a cave for sacks of grain and news of the war that's driven them all to such desperation. Onibaba is a film that seems to take place on the dark periphery of the heroic samurai epic. While the pretense of civility is maintained somewhere off in the grand castles of Throne of Blood or Kagamusha, here in the tall grass, where no one is looking, it's been completely abandoned. While the seven samurai are off saving the village, their wives have been left behind to revert into bloodthirsty primitives. Husbands, fathers, sons, the farmers who tame the land and beat back the tall grass, all of them gone, and no telling when or if they'll ever return. In the case of the two women, it's the one man, Kichi, the older woman's son and the younger woman's husband, who's left them both behind. With nothing else in common, the women's relationship, living together in the same small hut, seems built primarily on necessity or strength in numbers, and maybe as a sort of unified vigil for when Kichi might finally come home again. The tenuousness of this arrangement is soon made all too apparent when one day a former neighbor, a man named Hachi, returns home from the war and sets off a powder keg of lust, jealousy, superstition, and deceit. There's a sort of pop streak to Onibaba, from the opening titles set to slithering percussive jazz music to the copious nudity and its attitudes towards sex. There's a certain swinging 1960s rebelliousness to the story set in ancient Japan and inspired by Japanese folklore. While the visual centerpiece of the film, the Hanya Mask, has its origins in traditional no and Kyogen theater, representing a human woman transformed by jealousy into a demon, it's an image that's still used today in movies and video games. Hachi arrives at the marsh having deserted from the army, and in time reveals that Kichi has been killed, beaten to death by farmers while he himself managed to escape. Could Hachi be lying? Could he have murdered Kichi himself? The man, whatever he might have been before the war, appears just as conniving, just as unscrupulous as the women. He arrives dressed in the garments of a priest he claims to have killed while on the road. He asks the women how they themselves managed to survive this long, but whether from shame or an abundance of caution, a notion that they might have to kill Hachi just like they did the others, they refrain from telling him. It's only when trespassed upon by another pair of soldiers, locked in desperate combat, that the women finally drop all pretense. Hachi leads the way with a thrust of his spear to the one, the women follow suit by drowning the other. All at once, in a kind of primal initiation ritual, each is discovered the murderous complement of the other. Onibaba seems to explore that strange, indeterminate meeting place between blind animal instinct and shrewd human calculation. Passions run together with practicality. Jealousies work in tandem with self-preservation. Even lust. Even as a magnetic, heated lust blossoms between Hachi and the younger woman, even then there seems to be a certain utilitarian undercurrent. It's a lust not just of want, but of necessity. As if between the last two people on Earth. It's sex as medicine. 
an anesthetic for poverty, misery, guilt, war. The older woman as well. Her motivations seem to waver between the emotional and the practical. She's outraged that the younger woman should take up with a man who came back in place of her son. She's jealous and she's tormented by her own unsatiated lust. At the same time, there's also the fear that, once bonded to Hachi and once Kichi, the only real connection between the two women is put behind them, the younger woman would have no reason to stay with her, making it harder for her to kill and lessening her chances of survival. Whatever isn't said is writ large on the actor's face, on the face of the older woman in particular, played by Nobuko Otawa, the then mistress, future wife, and frequent collaborator of director Kaneto Shindo. The film gives us frequent close-ups of her heady, grease-painted stare, her tortured grimace. You can read her every suspicion, can see the misery and the shrewd cunning in her thoughts. In trying to keep the two lovers apart, the older woman warns her daughter-in-law about the dangers of sin, that an unwedded carnality such as hers is the road to hell and purgatory. When Hachi first returns, he and the older woman recount some of the strange, ominous occurrences they've encountered since the war began. <laughs> Altogether, it lays a bedrock for the supernatural, so that when one night a samurai in a demon mask comes to the old woman in her hut, even she can't help but cower as if he's the real thing. The samurai demands the woman show him the way out of the marsh, but yet again, whatever enters here may never leave, and instead she leads him into his death at the bottom of the pit. She climbs down into the hole and, with some difficulty, pries the mask from the samurai's face, revealing the mutilated visage underneath. Onibaba is sometimes classified as a horror movie. While the demons might not be literal and while the violence might not have the same tinge of unfettered sadism as in a Michael Myers film, there is still a certain stylistic flair in keeping with the genre. Upon retrieving the mask from the dead samurai, the older woman uses it to dress herself up like a demon, to scare the younger woman back inside whenever she tries to sneak off at night to meet with Hachi. And while we the audience might know it's just the trick, the film at times treats the demon woman like she's the real thing translating the younger woman's fear of the supernatural into the visuals. Eventually, the woman's charade comes to a head in a heavy rainstorm, as if the natural world itself were acting out the waylaid passions between Hachi and the younger woman. The younger woman runs through the tempest to meet with Hachi. The older woman, disguised as the demon, intercepts her and turns her away. This time, however, Hachi finds the younger woman, and after telling her there's no such thing as demons, the two of them reconsummate their lust right there in the tall grass. The demon never pounces on them to take their souls. Hell never opens up underneath their feet. What better exorcism could there be? What better refutation of the demon's power than to sin right there where it could see? The older woman, the demon, slinks away, powerless, defeated. After her tryst with Hachi, after the storm has ended, the younger woman returns to the hut only to find the demon crouched in the corner, perhaps come to punish her after all. She's frightened at first, until finally the older woman reveals herself, reveals her deceit. It seems the older woman can't get the mask off, that the rain has somehow glued it to her face, and she begs for the younger woman to help. When pulling on it fails, the younger woman picks up a mallet and in a frenzy pounds at the Hanya mask, pounds at the older woman. All her anger and all her resentment loosed upon whatever forces, be they earthly or supernatural, that would presume to govern her life. Eventually, the mask splits in two and comes away, and the older woman's face is revealed monstrously scarred by the thing, to the point where the younger woman believes she really has become a demon. Manipulation deforms the manipulator. Jealousy transforms the woman into the Onibaba. The younger woman runs away, and the older woman chases after her. The younger woman leaps over the pit, and the older woman follows suit. While it's not entirely clear whether the older woman makes the jump or not, I have to assume she did. I have to assume there are only two creatures in all that marshy purgatory who could possibly navigate the dark, ancient depths of the pit. <laughs>